listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Greg Felton, the author of the new book, Exploding Middle East Myths, 15 Years of Fighting Zionist Propaganda. Greg, thanks for joining us today. No problem, Dave. Glad to be here. Greg, you wrote The Host and the Parasite. Why this book and why now? Well, The Host and the Parasite looked at the origins and development of the essentially Zionist occupation of the United States. It was more of a historical scholarly work. This one, Exploding Middle East Myths, is a compilation of essays in various categories that demonstrates that American policy has changed very little, if at all, over the last 15 years. Now, the United States, if you think of it as a logical, rational country, you would think that there'd be some development, some progress, some sense to their foreign policy. But because Israel, through the lobby, through Congress, through the various pressure groups in the media, because they control so much of American policy, American policy has been essentially stuck. The same problems that persisted in 1995 are the same ones that persist today. And the answers that I provide in this book are directly applicable to the current administration. And I'm hoping people can read this book rather than pay attention to the idiocy and the propaganda and the distractions that pertain in the mainstream media to find out what's really going on with their country and why their country is declining and essentially headed, I believe, for civil war. Greg, this book is a compilation of essays you've written over the past 15 years. Why should a listener buy this book? What are they going to get out of it? They'll get out of it something that they're not going to get from the mainstream press or more contemporary books, and that is historical context. You see, the United States is not so much a country as it is an occupied former republic. The problems that beset America today have not changed in 15, 20, even 30 years. And if you look at the way the media presents policy, they don't look beyond the immediate day-to-day news. There's no context, there's no history, there's no logic behind it. What I've done in these essays is show that there is a cause and effect between the decline of the United States, both as an economic and as a political power, and the rise of Israel as the predominant influence in U.S. policy. Now, I look at the issue of American policy from many different angles. Part of it is in the politics of the Middle East and how the Middle least myths that pervade our culture are exposed and developed by the Israeli press. I look at how the censorship and intimidation of whistleblowers and intelligent people has become a day-to-day occurrence in this country. And people who read this book will notice that even though some of these articles are old and some are more recent, there's a lot of similarity. There's almost a continuum of illogic in American policy that starts in the mid-90s and goes up to the present. What this book does is shows why America is declining. It does not look at some narrow little speck on American history and pretend that this is a new event. There is nothing new in the United States. Everything you think you know about the United States is old. The United States has ceased to develop as a republic since 1980. And this book will do a lot of good to people who want to understand the nature of the United States and not be distracted by superficial trivia newscasts that simply look at the stock markets going up, stock markets recovering, housing prices are rising, housing prices are falling. There's nothing in these newscasts, these news reports, that's going to help anybody understand the world. What I do through this is show how the Middle East myths that have pervaded our consciousness for so long are utterly false. They're fraudulent. And it's these myths that lie at the root of the decline of the United States. So you're saying to understand the United States, you need to look at that little country in the Middle East. Well, essentially correct, because people look at Israel, they see a little sliver on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, but that's not what Israel is. Israel is not a country. It's an international terrorism conglomerate. It has industry, it has media, it has government agents. It permeates the world like a cancer. And although you can trace the cancer perhaps to one series of cells that began the disease, it has permeated the entire world. So to look at Israel and limit it to the eternally shifting boundaries of that particular state is an error. Israel is everywhere. Israel is in Washington, D.C., it's in Ottawa, it's in London, it's in Paris, it's in Sydney, it's everywhere. How do they get it everywhere? The Israelis have managed to play very well upon liberal guilt for World War II, and the Holocaust has been thrown up as the great excuse for not criticizing Israel. If you criticize Israel, you're anti-Semitic. To criticize Israel is to call attention to the Holocaust and the questionable factual foundation upon which that event has been handed down to us. Israel is very effective because it's ruthless. It commits murder, blackmail, terrorism. It knows no limits to its arrogance. 
And countries who are afraid of being targeted by Israel will naturally not want to upset it. Many of the banks in our world are run by people who are sympathetic to Israel. The media conglomerates like Wilbur Murdoch's empire, that is entirely run by a Zionist Jew. You have the Fox News Network, that's Murdoch. You have in Canada, the Post Media Group is run by people sympathetic to Israel. It's impossible to get an anti-Israeli or even a pro-Arab perspective that has not been pre-digested, pre-moralized, and essentially bastardized for our consumption. You said that they're ruthless. Aren't there other countries in the world that you would consider ruthless? Or is there something specific about these people in that country that make them ruthless? Every country can be ruthless to some extent. The United States is a perfect example of that. But Israel is a particularly odd creature. It has no moral, political, or historical legitimacy. It exists solely because it terrorized the world into approving its existence. And even at that, the approval was illegal and not really legally binding. But Israel cannot afford to be rational. It cannot afford to debate facts or history or even acknowledge that there is a moral order beyond the self-interest of the Zionist state. Israel is the greatest example of fascism in the modern world. And the fascist state acknowledges nothing above its self-interest. And so Israel will go to any lengths to stop people from investigating history, asking intelligent questions, pointing out obvious contradictions in its statements. So Israel cannot afford to stop killing. It cannot afford to stop terrorizing. If it does that, much like the Roman Empire, which stopped developing as it stopped expanding, it will begin to contract. It's like the Chinese saying, people who ride the tiger cannot jump off. If you fall off, you'll kill yourself. Israel is on a downward slope toward oblivion, and it can't stop. If it doesn't stop killing, if it doesn't stop stealing land, then it calls into question its very rationale for existence. The cult that lies behind Israel, the myth, the great myth that underlies Israel's existence, is that it has the right, the God-given right, to certain land in Palestine. In fact, all of Palestine and beyond. But because this is a religious precept, which is irrational and, frankly, indefensible, there is no logical or reasonable foundation for the Israeli state. So it is the myth that must be defended at all costs. The myth is Israel. Israel is myth, which is why if we explode the myth, we explode Israel. And if we explode Israel, hopefully the United States will regain some semblance of national independence. The book looks at the way the myth is propagated. It's propagated through media, through movies. It is propagated through accounts of history and current events. It is propagated through the media, through censorship and intimidation. And in fact, it's what's not reported that is the great strength of Israel because it censors critical news. I mean, Israel can put out propaganda, but you have a choice to believe it or not. But if news that's important is not reported, you don't know what's not reported. So you have no basis to criticize the other news that's handed down to you. Right. And one of my favorite chapters in this book is one that's called Hasbarats and Quisling. Now, the term Hasbarat is a term I coined for these rats that spelled Hasbara or Hasbara, which is essentially propaganda sympathetic to Israel. And these people infest our media and our government, and these are the people that define reality for us. And it's because of this that we don't know the truth, because these are the people whose job it is, is to defend and propagate the myths that make Israel possible, that justify Israel's existence. And those who seek to defend the United States against encroachment, against the bastardization of the Constitution, or to defend American interests above all else, these people are by definition mythbusters. These people have to be dealt with very strongly, which is why exploding the myths of Israel is integral to the rediscovery of Republican democracy in the United States. And what my book does is it shows these myths, the categories in which they exist, and the kind of arguments that are used to propagate them. So hopefully people who read this book will be armed and able to argue against Israel's agents, their Hasbarats, or the Arab Quislings who have sold themselves out to serve Israel at the expense of their own people. And I particularly refer to Mahmoud Abbas, who is the illegitimate governor of the Palestinian Authority. He is not the government of Palestine. The party Hamas won the last general election, and it is the only party that's authorized under law to speak for the Palestinian people. Abbas has been Israel's Quisling for decades, going back to the Oslo Agreement, whereby he and Yossi Balin tried to force a back-of-the-envelope solution on Yasser Arafat, by which Palestine would surrender everything to Israel in exchange for a kind of a promise from Israel not to kill them. <laughs> Abbas is the worst enemy the Palestinians have. 
and as people who appear to be good, appear to be anti-Israeli, appear to defend the rule of law, are perhaps the most dangerous because these people are more subtle, they're more dishonest, and they can convince people to subordinate their own reason to support something that is wholly indefensible. And that's what I was going to ask. Is there something unique about the leaders of Israel that perhaps allow them to be more aggressive than other states or individuals? Is there something unique about Jews? I wouldn't say there's something unique about Jews. I mean, Judaism breeds the conceit that there's somehow somebody who follows the religion has a God-given right to moral superiority. It does breed the notion that you can mistreat other people because they aren't Jews. It breeds a cultural chauvinism and an arrogance that is both sociopathic and self-destructive. But because Israel has managed to infiltrate the United States and find supporters among the radical Christians, people like John Hagee or Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson and the like, these people are of a religious mindset that is sympathetic with Israel's grand design to expel all Arabs from biblical Israel, so to speak and thereby bring about a political solution for the Jews that is both mythically indefensible and politically sadistic. So leaders of Israel have managed to become grafted onto the financial, media, industrial, educational. Every aspect of American society is shot through with Zionist influence. You forgot so political. No part of <laughs> political. That's true. Yeah. I mean, Congress is such a joke. There are no congressmen or congresswomen. There are merely people who are agents of Israel. Israel has so thoroughly Zionized Congress that one can no longer speak of an American government without committing a horrible solecism. American government does not exist. It has not existed for decades. America, as columnist Pat Buchanan once remarked, is Israeli-occupied territory, and he was right. There have been plenty of people throughout the United States in their history that have pointed out the degree and the cancerous extent of Zionist influence in America, but nobody pays that much attention to them. The media discounts them, the media rubbishes them, and you always have the Hasbarat, the Israeli propagandist who gets the last word in, who can spell whatever nonsense he wants just to get the message out. And right. in America, the lie is given equal standing with the truth. And in fact, more often than not, the lie is esteemed above the truth. So many people have a vested interest in perpetuating this fraud because their careers are built on it. Right. Now, you use the word cantorous a couple of times. That must really anger these people. Have you been attacked by these Zionists? Not physically, no. I've had nasty emails, and I've been vilified in the press. I've been libeled. But then again, so have many other people, far more erudite than I am on this subject. The term cancer is used not as an epithet of insult, but it's meant actually as a technical term. A cancer is an unnatural growth in a healthy body, and to persist, it must kill the surrounding healthy tissue to expand and feed off of its blood vessels and its food source. And that's what happened in Palestine. Palestine is an Arab area. There have been Jews that have been living there for centuries before the rise of the European invasion going back to the end of the 19th century. The 19th century was the beginning of the invasion of the Zionist Jew, the Ashkenazi Jew. The Ashkenazi Jew has no connection to Palestine. He's a culturally different person. He's European. He's not Middle Eastern. He's not Sephardic. He's not Semitic. He's European. And the cancer that took hold in Palestine persisted and developed and spread with the complicity of the United States. And in fact, if you look at the history of the destruction of Palestine and the 60 years of terrorism that has been inflicted upon the Palestinian people, the United States is more to blame than Israel. Because had it not been for the United States, Israel would not exist. Well, that is to say, Israel would not be insulated from having to pay the penalty for committing gross war crimes against innocent civilians. The United States was bought off years ago, going back to Harry Truman. But for the purposes of my book, the great disaster that befell the United States occurred in 1980, when Ronald Reagan became president. Because that was the first time that a pressure group, evangelical Christians, put a president into the White House. It was the Christian vote, more than anything else, that defeated Jimmy Carter. And it was the rise of the radical Christian, which has the same religious outlook to a large extent as the Zionist Jew. That is to say, they want the Arabs out of Palestine so that all the Jews can go back to Palestine so Jesus can come back down from heaven. It's a religious superstition that pervades much thinking in the United States and is the source of much of the irrationality and abject cruelty that is found in much American policy, both economic, military, and political. Mm -hmm. 
I imagine people in Israel are aware that their allies, the Christian Zionists, ultimately foresee that they will be destroyed, the Israelis. Isn't that right? Yeah, the great perversity of all this is that the people who are most hostile to Jews, who hate Jews the most, are the very Zionist Christians that Israel is relying on to subvert the United States. It is the most perverse marriage of inconvenience. I mean, nobody hates Jews more than the Zionists. I mean, the Zionists think that once Jesus swans down from heaven, all these Jews who didn't accept Jesus are going to live for a thousand years in turmoil. Meanwhile, all the good Christians are going to get raptured up to heaven. The great perversity of all this is that there is no sense to the United States. There's no rationality. There's no attempt to find a cause and effect between problem and solution. I mean, if you go back to the Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford era, now, even though there was much difficulty with the Vietnam War and the office of the presidency became seriously tarnished, perhaps irreparably, there was still the ability to formulate rational policy. There was none of this runaway hysteria about provoking wars in the name of fighting terrorism or bringing democracy to countries that America had no business bringing it to. The rhetoric that's being used to justify the invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Libya, and Syria is, of course, next on the list, is utterly irrational. It, it makes no sense. It's contradictory. It's so stupid that nobody with an ounce of intelligence would endorse it. But because America is no longer in charge of its own government, it has no say in it. It is really mouthing what its masters in Tel Aviv are telling it to do. American industry is based on the neoconservative belief that the more money you lend out, the better it is. When Ronald Reagan took over as president, the United States stopped regulating industry. It stopped regulating banking. It stopped regulating air traffic controllers. The purpose of government is to serve the public good, whether that's spending money for this or that project, whether it's telling people or an industry there's a limit to what you may do. Government stopped being responsible with Ronald Reagan. And when this happened, it made it possible for the Israeli influence in the United States to spread unchecked throughout every aspect of American society. Now, it's true, the banking industry is not, strictly speaking, tied exclusively to Israel. But the neoconservative mentality, which believes in absolute minimal government, no regulation, the defense of corporatism, all of this enables and accentuates the Israeli control over the United States. Remember, the bully, the tyrant, the despot is deathly afraid of the law. The law speaks for everyone. It speaks for all citizens. And the minute the law speaks, the bully must back down. And what has happened throughout the history of the United States and other countries is that when the law speaks and Israel is aggrieved, Israel gets the law changed. It did so in Spain and in the United Kingdom with respect to prosecuting and arresting Israelis who step on their territory. Now I understand that it's the United States has also rewritten its war crimes legislation to exempt Israelis from prosecution. And let us not forget that many of the banks that are in the Federal Reserve are run by Israelis. Goldman Sachs is a strong supporter of Israel and is one of the greatest contributors to the decline of the American economy. And if you want to know why America is forcing its own citizens to camp out in New York's financial district, occupying Wall Street, protesting the despoliation of the American economy, 60 million Americans impoverished by corrupt banking scandals. This is why America's banking industry, America's media industry, America's political industry, its industry period, has as its primary allegiance the support and defense of Israel. Americans are liabilities to the government in Washington, D.C., which I now call Washington, Tel Aviv. Well, Greg, that's a little bit extreme, don't you think? You're saying that the entire U.S. financial system is in the condition it is because of Israel? How can you explain that? Well, as I say, it's a little hard to see it initially. But if you look at the current total national debt of the United States, which stands at something like 14 to $15 trillion, one-fourth of that, at least, is directly attributable to the wars of aggression in the Middle East and South Asia and the Zionist police state apparatus under the Homeland Security Department. And of the money that Homeland Security disperses to agencies to fight terrorism, about 80% are Jewish. So it's very easy to see, with a little bit of research, the degree to which Jewish influence in American banking is directly at the root of the American banking collapse. There is no need for the United States to bomb Iraq, to bomb Afghanistan, to bomb Libya. There is no rationale for it at all. The only country to benefit from this in any way is Israel. 
And so it doesn't take much imagination to see the banking system in the United States as an extension of Israel's campaign to wage genocide against the Muslim peoples of the Middle East and South Asia as well. I mean, it's not something that's really traceable to any sort of document. You can put your finger on it. But you have to ask yourself, why on earth would the United States go out of its way to make enemies in the Middle East instead of trading with them? A good example is Saddam Hussein. In 1981, you had Donald Rumsfeld shaking hands with Saddam Hussein and saying he was an ally. Donald Rumsfeld turned a blind eye to Hussein's use of chemical weapons. All of a sudden, about 10 years later, we're bombing his country. You had Paul Wolfowitz and other people bemoaning the fact that then-President George H.W. Bush did not enter Baghdad and take out Hussein entirely. At what point in those 10 years did the United States change from being an ally of Saddam Hussein to an enemy? And in my book, The Host and the Parasite, I show how and why this happened. And it had nothing to do with American national interest. So if you look at how the United States has managed to alienate so many Arab states and become a pariah in the international community, you have to look at whose interest it is serving. And we can say this because the people who have been making policy and making decisions in the United States over prior allegiance to Israel, because from Reagan onwards, pro-Israel congressmen and senators managed to enter the government in increasing numbers to the point now where it's impossible to argue for an American first policy without being demonized as an anti-Semite. And that is bizarre. Greg, are you anti-Semitic? No, and the term itself is a nonsense term. There's no such thing as anti-Semitism. Why not? Well, the term Semitism was invented as a linguistic term to distinguish languages that had a certain sound different from Indo-European languages. Besides which, the Arabic language is Semitic, just as is Hebrew or Coptic or Aramaic, no biblical language. To be anti-Semitic is to be a nonsense. The term has no meaning. It's an empty, epithetic insult. It should be something like anti-Jew, right? Well, the term is meant to be anti-Jewish, but no one's going to say anti-Jewish. Anti-Semitic sounds, I don't know, somehow more acceptable. I don't know. All right, so are you anti-Jewish? No, I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm anti-Zionist, but I firmly admit that. But then so are many Jews. So the term becomes a circular name-calling game that doesn't get anywhere. Right. The problem with a lot of Israelis is that they cannot stand the fact that Zionism and Judaism are different things. So they invent and they assert an equivalence between Zionism and Judaism in order to demonize people who are critical of Israel as anti-Jewish. And of course, the equation is utterly fraudulent and entirely malicious. And that's one of the staples of Hasbro, the great Israeli propaganda machine. Right. Greg, you've studied this area of the world for many decades. What do you see happening there? After this whole Arab Spring now with Palestinians going right to the UN, what's going to happen? The future does not look good either for Israel or the United States. The only problem is we don't know quite how long it will take before both of these empires comes crashing down. The Roman Empire lasted until the year 476, and it began in the year 27 BCE. So it lasted for about 503 years. About a fifth of the way through, it started to decline when its empire became too big to manage financially, and the inexorable decline started to set in. Now, there was ups and downs when the economy started to pick up, it started to go down, but the empire was doomed because it couldn't sustain all those soldiers on the frontier forever. With the economy inside collapsing, with foreign trade not being possible because of the invasions and civil wars within the empire, eventually it did collapse. America is facing the same problem. The Arab Spring the rise of Muslim resistance to Zionist occupation is inexorable. It's not going away. Even if America tries to repress it, it will still come back, much like the liberal revolutions of 1848 in Europe, which really signaled the end of the royal families of Europe trying to stage manage and manipulate political affairs. Yes, they were repressed ruthlessly, especially in Austria-Hungary. Yet the effects of those revolutions persisted and manifested themselves later in the 19th century as socialism, as movements against the state and against the moneyed interests of Europe. In the United States now and in Israel, there is profound dissatisfaction, even disgust with Zionism, with corporatism, with selfish and corrupt banking practices. There is no possible way that America could stop the inexorable slide into irrelevancy. America is really in serious trouble unless it manages to stop funding Israel's wars of aggression. America has to rediscover itself. It needs a new declaration of independence. 
It needs a declaration of independence from Israel because Israel is so much in control of the media and of the security apparatus. I mean, look at my God, Michael Chertoff. He's a dual Israeli citizen, and he's in charge of American security. That's insane. Because of America's subordination to Israel, it's going to take a long time before Americans finally organize in sufficient numbers to bring the apparatus down. And I don't know how long this will take. But at some point, Americans are going to stop to look at their country and realize who the real enemy is. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. It's not the immigrants. It's not the businesses. It's the people behind the corporate structure. Right. And the best thing to do is to equate the United States today with the fascist states of the mid to early 20th century. This is a state that is based upon selfishness, the blind acquisition of wealth by a handful of corporations. And if you want to know why the United States has collapsed, look what happened to Mussolini's Italy. It couldn't sustain itself. And this is what we have now in America. We have a fascist government. Fascist governments are necessarily at war with their own people because the fascist cares nothing about helping the welfare of the public. The fascist is concerned only with maximizing profit, to helping those people at the very thin stratum of society which governs everything. Yeah, and of course we shouldn't forget about not blaming the Muslims, right? Because that was the whole idea of 9-11, wasn't it? The 9-11 attack, as I've mentioned as the host in The Parasite, was designed for an ulterior motive. And the ulterior motive was passage of the Patriot Act. And I don't think I've seen anybody else make this argument. When Yasser Arafat refused to sign away the future of Palestine at the Camp David Agreements, which was corrupt from the beginning, Israel was left with an insoluble problem. The Palestinians wouldn't play ball, so now we have to find some way to get the United States to do our dirty work for us. We have to destroy the entire Arab world. We have to destroy the Muslim resistance, which is why we had the attack on the World Trade Center. And it was stage managed to make the Arabs look like the villains. Now, it's possible that many Arabs were involved with this, where the Arabs, whether they were Pakistani, who knows. But the fact is, the Muslims could not possibly have had the sophistication of the organization to carry it out. And I don't care who you are, you cannot rationalize this as a Muslim plot. It doesn't make sense. There is no scenario conceivable under which a Muslim could have had access to the aircraft, to get into the cockpit, to change the transponder codes of all four aircraft. It doesn't make any sense. The Arabs don't have that kind of access. Not to mention shutting down the entire air defense of the United States. Exactly. Well, don't forget also that it was Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Bush that stripped the colonel of the local Air Force base from the right to intercept aircraft heading toward the Pentagon and the White House. They vested right. that control in their own hands, and that's why they allowed the attack on the Pentagon to take place. And you try to explain this to some people, and they look at you as if you had six heads. You know, they're all conspiracy theorists. But the only conspiracy theory that makes no sense is trying to explain how a bunch of Arabs could have done this, especially when the damage to the buildings is incommensurate with the delivery vehicle of the damage. I mean, there was no aircraft that went into the Pentagon. I have pictures of the Pentagon. I look right. at the front of it. It doesn't make sense. The entire World Trade Center attack was an Israeli-driven, perhaps American-executed, self-inflicted wound to poison the world against Muslims and to make it acceptable for the United States as Israel's building club to beat the bejesus out of Arabs. It was a stage-managed event as corrupt and venal as the Reichstag fire in Berlin or the assassination of Leningrad party boss Sergei Kirov, which Stalin then used to set up the purges in the reign of terror in the Soviet Union. Greg, you know, one thing I noticed about the exploding Middle East myth is that besides the serious essays in there, there is some satire in there, isn't it? Yes, and this is what I'm most happy about in this book. A few years ago, I realized that I felt I was sort of pounding my head against a brick wall, making rational arguments in favor of a Palestinian position. And I realized that, you know, maybe it's time to start approaching this topic a little differently. So I started writing satires, satirical dialogues. I invented my own television station called WTFN. And I had my own avatars, my own hosts for the show. And I would have people on from the Israeli lobby or from other areas. And I would have them discuss things. And one of my favorite ones is, for example, is the Oscar preview shows, where I talk about movies and the persistence of propaganda films about the Holocaust. And I invented a new category of award called the Lenny, in honor of Lenny Riefenstahl, who produced and directed many great films in German history. But she fell afoul of the movie industry by making propaganda films for Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party. And so even though Riefenstahl was a brilliant director, her name is held in high odium because of that. And so I thought it would be interesting to see what movies each year could be recipients of the Lenny Award for conspicuous service in propagating Israeli propaganda to the world and blogging the Holocaust. 
And the first winner was two years ago, which was The Reader, starring Kate Winslet and Ray Fiennes. And last year's winner was The Odious and Glorious Bastards, starring, of course, Brad Pitt, which I think he owes an apology for, directed by Quentin Tarantino. Right. And another one I use, I think that's in there, is called Pet Politicians. I look at how politicians are basically pets of the Israel lot and how they behave and sort of do tricks as they're commanded. I enjoy doing these because they do manage to get points across in a much stronger way, in a much more sharper way, because they do so through greater use of entertainment and use of language. The one that drew the most attention, I guess, was the one that caused a stir at the UN. Why don't you tell listeners a little bit about that without giving away the entire story so they can read it for themselves? Yes, this was a spoof I did of Ban Ki-moon. In 2009, Israel celebrated its 60th anniversary as a member of the United Nations. And one of the things that most people do not know is that Israel is not a legitimate member of the UN. It is in violation of its terms of admission, but no country, nobody has the courage to bring this up at the General Assembly and expel the Israelis. Because America wields such a coercive influence that there is no freedom of vote at the UN. Everything is coerced. So what I did was I had Ban Ki-moon make this speech that was factually accurate, made painstakingly researched, and it was done on mocked-up UN letterhead. And I sent it out to lots of people, and matter of fact, it caused such a stir in the UN and in the Senate and the White House, by the way, that there were calls for my arrest. <laughs> there were calls for Ban Ki-moon to dissociate himself from it. There was a hysteria. I was interviewed by one Jewish organization, the Jewish Telegraph Agency. It was written about in two other Jewish media sources. It was one of the most successful things I've ever done. And it was the simplest thing to do. You know, I just wrote this speech, and it was so believable. And people were actually discussing this on bulletin boards, on news nets, on websites, on blogs. I managed to get people talking about UN General Assembly Resolution 273, by which Israel was admitted to the UN. I got them to look at the basis for that. I got them debating the illegitimacy of Israel. Although you can't say it's Israel is illegitimate because it was never legitimate to begin with. <laughs> I loved it. It was so much fun. And I recommend that people go to the PDF link in the book to see exactly what I wrote. Well, let me let the listeners know where they can get this book. You can go to the American Free Press website, AmericanFreePress.net, and at the top, just click on Store, go to the column on the left, New. You click on New because this is a new book. Greg, in closing, let our listeners know what you think is the most important event that's occurred in the Middle East over the past several weeks. I would probably say the destruction of Libya, because the United States right now is so overextended in the wars that it can't afford with Afghanistan and Iraq. No matter how much Barack Obama or anybody else talks about pulling America out, America is in there for the long haul, and it will continue to hemorrhage money to prop up this ridiculous, wasteful war. Now it's got involved with Libya, and it's going to hemorrhage more money. And the more money it hemorrhages, the less money it has for its own people. You watch. Social security will become a thing of the past. American entitlements, the privilege of being born an American citizen, it will no longer be a privilege. It will be a liability. When Americans start to go hungry, when Americans start to lose their houses in even greater numbers, the American core will not be able to survive. And eventually, America is going to militarize itself into oblivion the way the Roman Empire did. I guess it goes back to the fact that the politicians in the U.S. Congress can't agree on anything for the American people, but they all can agree on Israel. Well, they can all agree that the American public doesn't matter. They can all agree that the American public only exists to give a superficial patina of democracy to a government that's wholly imperious and despotic. There's no point even voting in an election anymore. You're voting for enslavement. And Americans have to start realizing that they're worse off today than they were in 1773. There's going to have to be some sort of violence take place in the United States on a national-wide scale to unseat the thugs that are running the country. There is no America left. America is a shell. It is an exhausted, expired, wasted corpse of a country. And Americans have to stop kidding themselves that they live in democracy. They have to see the country for what it really is occupied and bastardized republic that is now a billy club for a foreign government. And that really is the message of my book. If you want to save America, you have to fight the propaganda that keeps it enslaved. Right. And the best way to fight it is to get this book and to read it and get on the same wavelength that Greg's on. Greg, I want to thank you for the time you took explaining all this to the listeners. Exploding Middle East myths, 15 years of fighting Zionist propaganda should be in everybody's library if they care about America.
Greg, thanks so much. You're welcome.